suppose if I were living in uh, the era of Nazi Germany, suppose if I were living uh, when the occupation was there by the British of the US, suppose if I were living in the state of apartheid, what would I do? Would I just stay quiet, coming together, enjoying, speaking about the scriptures? Or would I do some action, positive action, peaceful action, proactive action? So it's really important that we need to put pressure on the government to save the lives. Every life is equal. If we actually believe in it, that means our tax paying dollars are doing, going there. We need to put pressure on our government on P and to bring sanity back again. Yes, for that, we need to have courage. So may God give us the courage to stand up and to unite ourselves for the sake of humanity with the guidance of God. Inshallah, God will help us. Thanks a lot for coming. King Edward VII from England, he said that every single Jew in my land, you cannot live here anymore. Tragedy, one more tragedy, right? Where did the Jewish uh, cousins, our brothers and sisters, where did they go? They did not go to the parts of Europe and other, you know, Germany and France and Portugal and Hungary and Italy. Every single time they were persecuted, our Jewish brothers and sisters, they came to the Muslims. Again, one of the most tragic things, so what happened was, when Spain was reconquered by the Europeans at that time, every single Jew and Muslim up there, they got only three choices. Either you convert to Christianity, or you are burned at stake, or you would be kicked out. Come on, look at the three choices. So what happened was, those people who do not want to live up there, Ottoman Empire, they went to the Ottomans, they went to Morocco, they went to uh, Algeria, they went to Egypt, they went to North Africa, and some of them, they were welcome in Palestine. Six million of our brothers and sisters, tragically, tragically, in this Holocaust that happened. But all the Muslims, what they did, all the Muslim countries, the Kosovo, the Bosnia, and the Albania, and Morocco, and, uh, and Ottoman Empire, right, Turkey, and Iran, and, and Iraq, they made, a, they made a pact. They made a pact saying that we're not going to hand over any single Jew to the Nazis. So they wrote false documents for the Jewish people, saying that these are our people, we're not going to let them go, they are going to stay with us. So uh, Turkey, it saved 75,000 Jewish people from being extinct by the Nazis. Iran saved 2,000 people. Bosnia and Kosovo and Albania and Morocco all combined, more than 200,000 people. They were safe and protected and their life were preserved by the Muslims. That is reality, that is the truth and those are the teachings of Islam. Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of God, the most beneficent and the most merciful, and welcome and greet all of you with the Islamic greeting of Assalamu Alaikum, which means what, Rabbi? Peace, of the world. Peace be upon you. She got it right. Very good. <laughs> I would be disappointed if you didn't. All right. You know, when I came here, approximately 5.30, there were about five, six people, and I was thinking, uh, would the rest of you come or not? Because it was a weekday. But when I see all of you coming here, it shows that you have the courage, the wisdom, the sincerity to come to the mosque and to learn from each other. On behalf of the mosque, I want to give all of you a big round of applause for coming over here. And obviously the volunteers of the mosque, the children, the women, the families, big round of applause to all of them for making this possible. I think the two important reasons why we are here, reason number one, you know, there is so much fear of the unknown, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism, friction, chaos, but humans when we come together and meet with each other, many of those barriers, they will go away at the end of the day, we see each other as humans. So I pray that may God give us the courage, the unity, so we can work together for better societies. May God help us all. Yes. Yes. Thank you. You know, when I, heard, uh, when I heard about the murder of that young boy, six year old, the very first thing that I was thinking in my mind, 
is that the passage from the Quran, chapter number 5, verse number 32. Chapter number 5, verse number 32, God is addressing exactly the same thing and God is saying, and here is the translation, Steve. God is saying that taking one innocent life is like taking the life of all of humanity. And then God says that saving one innocent life it's like saving the life of all of humanity. So when I heard about that tragedy, I thought maybe the whole humanity died with that boy. That's how intense it is. Every single human in Islam, I know in your faith too, we are all equal in the eyes of God. All humans are equal. Our life, our blood, our, uh, our soul is equal. So I live in Skokish. So there, it's a multi-cultural you know, and racial and... Uh, and faith-based society. So there are many, many Jewish schools up there. So when I pa pass, when I drive by them, I see all of these armed guards, you know, all around the school. When I came to the mosque, I saw armed guards all around the mosque. When I go out on the road, extra security. This is not the way we are supposed to live with each other. So I received a, a text message said from a Muslim, it says that a friend of mine was approached by his neighbor in Lincolnwood saying that the Quran states to kill the Jews and the Christians and may God help us all. So first and foremost I would say that when we received this message, the first answer which I gave it to them is no, right? Of course not. You know, any scripture can be taken out of context. I mean, Rabbi, I read the Bible, right? I mean, the Bible says so many things. If a person takes things out of context, you can spin and give any message to the Old Testament, New Testament, any scripture for that matter. So we have to read the scriptures in the proper context. And here is the surprise. There is a professor by the name of Dr. David Warrenstein. So in 2012, he wrote this uh, important article. So what did, the, uh, what did the Muslims did for the Jews? And this came in the Jewish Chronicle in 2012. And the very first sentence he said in there is that Islam saved the Jewry. Islam did not kill the Jewry. Islam saved the Jewry. And, and the reason he gave is this. You know, back in the, in the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the 7th century, the Romans, or, or I should say the Byzantines, the Persians, the Egyptians, and the superpowers of that time, they were out there to really kill all the Jews and to extinct them from the face of this earth. And back at that time, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, with his policies, with his autonomy to the Jews, safety to the Jews, he protected, the, he protected our Jewish cousins to such an extent that the Jewish scholars, they come and say that if not for Muslims or Islam, they would not be a Jewish person today. That is history, by the way. So one homework for all of you, right? One assignment for all of you. You can go to the jc.com and please read that article. It is really eye-opening, right? It is really eye-opening. Now, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was born, he was born in Mecca and he was preaching the oneness of God for about 13 years, from the age of 40 up until he was 53. Some people in Mecca, they agreed with the monotheism. The same monotheism that Prophet Moses and Prophet Jesus, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, David, Solomon, they all taught monotheism. So the Prophet was preaching, uh, preaching exactly the same thing. Some idol worshippers, they liked the message and they converted. Many of them, they did not. So they came after his life. So he moved from Mecca to Medina in the year 622. So once he moved to Medina, he found a big Jewish community up there. So one of the very first things that he did, he dictated a charter, a constitution, and that constitution says that Muslims and Jews, we would be one people. We are going to look out for each other. See, he had the power. He could have abolished all of them. He did not. He wrote that constitution. So you can look, at, look up the constitution. You can Google it. It is called as the Charter of Medina or the Medina Charter. Right? That's the second homework for all of you. The Charter of Medina, in which the Prophet, he dictated that the Jewish people, they have the total autonomy in the state, Islamic state of Medina. They will have their own synagogues, their own culture, 
their own penal system, their own, uh, their own, uh, you know, any system that they desire, they have it within the Islamic State, and they will be protected away from all of those forces which are out there to kill them. Then some of you, you may know from your history. So anyone historian over here, right? History teacher? Nobody? Oh, you are. So, wow, they're all pointing at you. So I can, so I can quiz you now, right? <laughs> no? So what happened was, in the year 70, uh, the Romans, they destroyed the second Jewish temple. It was a big tragedy, right? It was a big tragedy. So from that point on, almost every single Jewish person from, from that region of Palestine, and especially Jerusalem, they were kicked out of that land. Literally for 600 years, the Jews, they cannot come and pray up there. They cannot have the synagogues or homes in the land. But then what happened was, in the year 637, you know, the second caliph, the first caliph was Abu Bakr. The second caliph was Umar. So once he came to Jerusalem, he made a constitution again called as the Pact of Umar. And the Pact of Umar says that every single Jew who left Jerusalem, they are now free to come back. Muslims are going to protect you. So when they were kicked out for 600 years by other people, Muslims invited them back again in Palestine. Live amongst us. You are our brothers. You are our sisters in this wonderful humanity. See, this is a fact, by the way. See, if people, if they get educated by this important historical truths, there would be less anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and less crimes as we see up there. Now, a wonderful thing happened, which is called as the Golden Age in Spain. So Muslims were part of Spain from 711 all the way to 1492. So during that time, the Jewish people from all over the Europe and different parts of the world, they started to come and they started to live up there. Not only they were living, not only they were thriving, but according to the virtual Jewish encyclopedia, this was the golden age of Judaism in their history. This is the best time that they ever had under the Muslims. This is documented history. If people up there who are fighting and dropping bombs and killing people and each other, this is important history that if we can live for thousand years in the past, peace and harmony, inshallah, God willing, we can do exactly the same now. So this is history, by the way. And then, as we know, uh, 1182, a tragedy happened to our Jewish brothers and sisters. King Edward VII from England, he said, that every single Jew in my land, you cannot live here anymore. Tragedy, one more tragedy, right? Where did the Jewish uh, cousins, our brothers and sisters, where did they go? They did not go to the parts of Europe and other, you know, Germany and France and Portugal and Hungary and Italy. Every single time they were persecuted, our Jewish brothers and sisters, they came to the Muslims. They started to live under the Muslim Spain. Muslims opened our hearts, our land, and welcomed them, saying that you can live here, you are our people, you are free and we will protect you. This is history, by the way, right? And from France, they were also, you know, unfortunately kicked out three different times. They were let go, then they were brought back, and let go and brought back, but every single time our Muslim cousins, they started to protect them. And not only when Muslims accommodated the Jewish people, they were given high positions, like prime ministers and ministers and the wazirs and the main physicians. So they were thriving under the Muslim Spain. They were living there and they were thriving with key positions. So then unfortunately the Spanish Inquisition happened. Again, one of the most tragic things. So what happened was, when Spain was reconquered by the Europeans at that time, Every single Jew and Muslim up there, they got only three choices. Either you convert to Christianity, or you are burned at stake, or you would be kicked out. Come on, look at the three choices. So what happened was, those people who do not want to live up there, Ottoman Empire, they went to the Ottomans, they went to Morocco, they went to uh, Algeria, they went to Egypt, they went to North Africa, and some of them, they were welcome in Palestine. So let me read this for you. Sultan Mehmed II, <clears throat> in 1453, this is the letter he wrote to the Jewish people. 
and then he said that who amongst you all my people that is with me may god be with him let him ascend to istanbul right let them come to istanbul the site of my imperial throne let him dwell in the best of the land each beneath his wine and beneath his fig tree with silver gold wealth and cattle let him dwell in this land trade in it and take possession of it those are the teachings of islam by the way that's exactly what prophet muhammad peace be upon him that's what he did to protect the jews when they were at the brink of extinction then unfortunately in portugal they were kicked out in 1497 again they came to muslim morocco they came to the muslim uh, ottomans and then they came to uh, the region of palestine and last but not the least last but not the least the tragedy that happened in world war 2 6 million of our brothers and sisters tragically tragically in this holocaust that happened but all the muslims what they did all the muslim countries the kosovo the bosnia and the albania and morocco and uh, an ottoman empire right turkey and iran and and iraq they made a, they made a pact they made a pact saying that we are not going to hand over any single jew to the nazis so they wrote false documents for the jewish people saying that these are our people we are not going to let them go they are going to stay with us so uh, turkey it saved 75000 jewish people from being extinct by the nazis iran saved 2000 people bosnia and kosovo and albania and morocco all combined more than 200000 people they were safe and protected and their life were preserved by the muslims that is reality that is the truth and those are the teachings of islam so when we look into the chaos which is going on around the world we need to look into our humanity right i mean we can always say that i am palestinian and muslim a jew a christian but one of the blessings that god has given to us he gave us the guidance he gave us the faculty to distinguish between right and wrong but one of the best gifts that he gave us he gave us the humanity we can calibrate our compass based upon the shared humanity that we have so what are some of the common themes i'm going to wrap up quickly because i want to hear from our uh, you know esteemed rabbi who is here so what are some of the common themes that we have between uh, islam christianity and judaism and i want to ask you that question okay and nobody looks at the banners up there okay just don't look at the banners no don't look at the banners <laughs> now everyone is going to look it right <laughs> <laughs> come on that's what kids do always <laughs> okay who can name me three three common concepts between islam uh, judaism and christianity raise of hand right yes ma'am three others that you would like to be treated yes the golden rule which is common okay two more let's get two more yes mama fear monotheism we all believe that there is a creator compared to the atheists the agnostics and others right okay give me one more yes sir we all are children of god yes yeah, so, so we are children of god or we say we are creation of god so we are all humans we are all brothers and sisters okay give me one more okay <laughs> give me one more this is all good yes ma'am yes Uh, so for muslims one of the five pillars of islam so the ver- the very first one is to recite the shahada the testimony of faith witnessing in the oneness of god and in the messengership of muhammad peace be upon him second one is to pray five times third one is to give at least 2.5% of our saved assets in charity to the poor the needy and the less fortunate the fourth one is to uh, fast in the month of Ramadan and the fifth one who remembers that Yes going for pilgrimage right All right uh, and some other commonalities that we have you know the most mentioned prophet in the whole Quran by name is none other than the greatest prophet of the Jewish scriptures prophet Moses 136 times more than Jesus more than Muhammad peace be upon him more than any prophet the greatest prophet of the old testament is one of the greatest prophet of the quran mary as you can see that poster up there the only lady mentioned by name in the whole quran is no, is none other than mary the mother of jesus 
I can say more about it, right? So let's take a look at some of the common profits that we have. Some of the common profits that we have. You know, I have two sons. We love the biblical prophets to such an extent that I named both my sons with the name of the biblical prophets. My youngest one, fifth grade, he is a Yusuf for Joseph. My oldest one, he's in 10th grade, he's Ibrahim for Abraham. So this is what I will say, right? There are more Muslims with the names of the biblical prophets than all the Jews of the world combined. <laughs> Think about that, <laughs> all right? So look at this, right? The commonalities and, uh, and the respect, the honor that we give to prophets and the messengers. And but all the synagogues are still present in the Muslim lands, built and protected by the Muslim land. So let me wrap up by mentioning that the reason the Muslims, they had the shared history, excellent, amazing golden age is because Muslims were following this golden rule. All right. And this passage of the Quran, I will end with this. It is there in one of the walls of the Harvard Law School. And this passage is so amazing. It says, and this can teach us a lesson. So the passage of the Quran, it says, chapter number 4, verse number 135. Let's take a look at this. That all you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah, even as against yourself or your parents or your kin, and whether it be against rich or poor, for Allah can best protect both. So what God is saying is that we should stand up for justice even if the justice goes against you and your parents and your loved ones or the rich or the poor doesn't matter. What matters is that not that I should protect my own because I'm a Jew, a Christian, a Muslim or a Palestinian. What God is saying that the first and foremost, the foundation of justice is that uh, we should stand up unbiased. So I pray that if we see each other first and foremost as humans equal to each other nobody is superior our blood is sacred our souls are precious in the eyes of God and if we go with this principle that I then I hope and pray that this wars and this oppression and the hostages would be free and these crimes would be lessened and hopefully eradicated and humanity will live as brothers and sisters without anti-Semitism, without Islamophobia, without racism. And uh, this will be the ultimate success if we follow God's guidance and live as brothers and sisters. May God guide us all and may God bless us all. Thanks a lot for coming. Good question, yes. Yes, Brother Zulfi. Do you have any comments about uh, what can a people of conscience, peace-loving people can do in the current situation. Very good, very good. Uh, you know, that is important that, yes, we can talk about our scriptures. Yes, we can talk about uh, how good the baklava is, right? We can talk about, you know, how we can live together. But right now as we speak, right, as now as we speak, close to 12,000 innocent people, they have been murdered bombs no food no just imagine right i have family i cannot even imagine just yesterday you know since october 7th i was controlling myself yes my heart was crying my eyes were not i was controlling myself brother zulfi yesterday then i got the news then i cannot i cannot control myself yesterday the news which i received they showed images of babies in the incubators the fuel ran out and they died. Yes. So what can we do as humans, as brothers and sisters now today, right? What we can do, I have five step, five uh, point action item for all of us. Number one is this, right? Number one is this. First and foremost, the foundation, as I mentioned, that with the raise of hand, do you all agree that life is equal for each single human with the raise of hand? Of course, I would be disappointed if somebody did not raise their hand, right? 
So that's the important foundation that we have to start from that aspect. If we don't agree with that, then obviously if we look down at each other, there are going to be chaos and there are going to be oppression, it will continue. So that's what we should start off with, number one. The number second step is also really important, that occupied people, they have the right to fight against the oppression, against, the, against any occupation. For that reason, we support Ukraine. For that reason, we say, you know, Gandhi was so famous because he fought against uh, the British Empire. For that reason, we praise the, you know, Washington and others. For that reason, we fought against apartheid because oppressed people, they have the right to fight back. This is just in, in the UN conventions, every scripture of our humanity says that. However, in fighting back, there are certain guidelines that Islam wants us to obey. Really important. And what are those guidelines? You know, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that uh, even in a just war, no women, no children, no non-combatants should be touched or killed. Not even pinched, by the way, right? Forget about killing. So we have to be so careful. There is no Hiroshima Nagasaki in Islam. There is no cutting down of the trees or taking the resources, the internet, the fuel, the food, the water in Islam, even of the enemy civilian population. See, if we start taking exception to killing civilian life, if we start taking ex exceptions, then other party, other groups, they may take exceptions. So international law dictates that every life is equal and we need to preserve it, especially the innocent one who are non-combatants, without any exception, without any exception. And the last important point is this, that both the sides, both the parties, they should start obeying international law. International law dictates that oppression should be removed. That's international law. Nobody should be oppressing each other. No occupation should be there. Number one, occupation should be removed. Number two, number two, there have to be an immediate ceasefire. If we say that there are exceptions to it, then the other side may also have exceptions. Then it is going to be an endless war. So that's number two, right? In the international thing. Number three would be that the blockade has to be lifted. Total blockade has to be lifted. Number four is, according to the UN conventions, according to the UN resolutions, every single one of them and their progeny, the 780,000 Palestinians who were kicked out from the land, they have the right to return. Who's saying that? Not me as a Muslim or somebody as a Jew, a Christian. This is the international law. See, if somebody says we don't want to obey by the international law, other party will do the same. Then where do we go from there? Number four within the international law is this, that every single Jewish settlement is illegal. Not according to me, international law says that. If we don't agree with that, other party will not agree. Unless war is going to continue. And last but not the least, right? Last but not the least. There should be a crime tribunals in which there should be independent body. They should examine both sides. Doesn't matter if there's a prime minister, president, or head of this, uh, this state, or this, uh, this uh, leader, or that person. Doesn't matter, there should be unbiased war crimes tribunals. Supported by the US and by the UN, by every country. And if they're held accountable, any person, doesn't matter their status, we have to go with that principle. And if that person is accountable or those, those people are accountable, we should punish them by the highest extent of the law. If we don't do it, that means, you know, when we say about freedom and, uh, you know, against apartheid, all of these words are going to be empty words. Next time if somebody utters to me, you know what, freedom for Ukraine, let's all stand. Well, come on, empty words. If you're going to stand up for Ukraine and other countries, we should equally stand up for every other country. Because if you don't believe in that, that means we don't agree that every life is equal. So that is the five-step plan for how to bring peace and move towards peace. May God help us, may God guide us, may God join our hearts so we can start living in brothers and sisters with that plan, inshallah. Thank you.
suppose if I were living in uh, the era of Nazi Germany, suppose if I were living uh, when the occupation was there by the British of the US, suppose if I were living in the state of apartheid, what would I do? Would I just stay quiet, coming together, enjoying, speaking about the scriptures? Or would I do some action, positive action, peaceful action, proactive action? So it's really important that we need to put pressure on the government to save the lives. Every life is equal. If we actually believe in it, that means our tax paying dollars are doing, going there. We need to put pressure on our government on P and to bring sanity back again. Yes, for that, we need to have courage. Neil D. Uh, Grass Tyson. So what he mentioned is, you should be shameful of dying. Look at this. You should be shameful of dying if you are not winning for humanity. Think about it. So may God give us the courage so we don't regret later on that why, did, uh, why didn't we step up. So may God give us the courage to stand up and to unite ourselves for the sake of humanity with the guidance of God. Inshallah, God will help us. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you Your very much. Your speech was very good. Yeah, very inspiring. Thank you. Time for action. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> okay. absolutely. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very Thanks nice. a lot. Thank you for coming. You can take uh, the brochures up there.